Welcome to our seventh virtual field trip in the Soil and Water Conservation Series. Uh, funded by the Natural Resource Conservation Service and hosted by us, University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. My name is Matt Fryer. I'm a soils instructor for the University of Arkansas Extension Service. And, and we're just happy that you've joined us today to, to learn about some collaborative efforts uh, between the Natural Resource Conservation Service, Conservation Districts, and the U University of Arkansas Extension Service on soil health uh, on-farm demonstrations uh, to help improve soils and uh, improve farmer profitability. And so the Natural Resource Conservation Service is a federal organization that provides uh, federal dollars to farmers to um, implement conservation practices on their farm to conserve natural resources. And University of Arkansas Extension Service is an organization uh, through the land grant university system um, where we extend research-based knowledge in the areas of agriculture, family consumer sciences, and uh, community economic development, just to name a few. And, and so, in, in the conservation districts and NRCS really work together in tandem. Um, and, and so what we're doing is using these on-farm three-year demonstrations uh, as, a, as a vehicle to help us to collaborate together to bring the most benefit to our farmers. And so, another interesting um, Another interesting collaboration with Arkansas State University. They're, they're working with us at uh, one of these sites in Greene County that you'll hear about today. Dr. Steve Green and his students are helping us take some measurements uh, that, that we don't have the resources to take. They've got edge of field water monitoring systems uh, in this demonstration in, in Greene County and the roll rice demonstration, really measuring uh, nutrient runoff in the field. And so that's a really important collaboration and we're thankful to have them on board. And so before we go any further, I'd just like to let everybody know that one of the benefits of a live virtual field trip is that you have the opportunity to submit questions. And so if you'll use the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can submit questions at any time throughout this broadcast and we'll get, get to those at the end and answer as many as possible. And so like I said, today we're gonna to talk about on-farm demonstrations that we have across the Delta. These are three year long demonstrations and we're taking a lot of soil measurements, uh, a lot of samples out in the field. And so right now we're gonna to go to the field and we're gonna kind of demonstrate how those are taken. So welcome to the field here near Paragould, Arkansas. We're on Clay and Terry Smith's farm. And this is one of the sites, one of the 20 sites we have across the Delta uh, that we have our cover crop demonstrations implemented in. And so what we're doing here at this site is we have the, the field split in half. We have a cover crop and no-till production practice on one side. And on the other side, we have uh, conventional practices, usually with tillage involved in that side. And we're taking a bunch of different soil measurements. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to demonstrate those now. And so all of these samples that, we'll be, that I'll demonstrate, we're taking at year one. Uh, of the demonstration and at the third year because these are three year long demonstrations uh, because we expect to see a lot of the changes in these soil measurements to occur over a longer period of time. So we don't expect to see much change in, in one year. So, so that's why we're, we're stretching these out to about three year length. And so we're taking routine soil samples. Um, it's taken with this uh, probe. And so it just, you stick it in the ground and it has a stop washer at the correct depth, and uh, we'll, and then you just pour the core, core out in, into a bucket, and then send it off to the lab. This is used for uh, routine uh, fertility recommendations, uh, so you can know your soil pH and organic matter. Then we're also taking uh, nematode samples. Now nematodes are uh, microscopic um, organisms that s some are. Uh, parasitic and they feed on our plant roots. Others are beneficial and actually feed on other nematodes and so we kind of get the whole gamut uh, of, of nematodes when we take these samples. Um, but we need to take these samples at deeper depths, uh, about 10 inches deep and so that's that's what I use this for. It's got a, a foot peg on it and um, we go down about 10 inches when the ground's not solid, hard and dry. And then we just, uh, again, like the routine, we, we pour the dirt into a bucket and send it to the lab. Some other samples are taken are going to be bulk density. And so bulk density is just uh, the measure of uh, how heavy the soil is in a given area. 
And so we take these samples with, a this is called a slide hammer, and this is our bulk density cup. So we just stick it in the ground and hammer this in. We pull it out. So again, this is, uh, this is just the measure of how heavy the soil weighs in a given area. So we know the area in this cylinder. And so we cut this dirt off where it's level. And so we have a cylinder full of soil. And we'll send this to the lab and they'll dry it, weigh it, and uh, calculate bulk density. We're also taking aggregate stability samples and so this is taken the same way as the bulk density sample, just with a larger cup. I've already taken this, just to save a little time. And, and so again, we, we take, we, we take uh, the, the top two inches for the aggregate stability, um, and we'll cut that off, put it in the bag, send it to the lab. And then we'll also do the next two inches put that in the bag and send it to the lab. And what they do with those is they've got a, a, a series of sieves um, that they stack on top of one another. They'll dry this soil for aggregate stability. They'll stick it in on the sieves and stick it down in, in water and kind of oscillate it back and forth. And as those aggregates break down, they'll go through the different size mesh sieves. And after they do their uh, oscillation, they'll take the sieves back out, dry the soil in the sieves, weigh it, and then they can um, tell what percentage of the soil um, held together. And so the more soil that holds together, the better, because that means we're going to have less uh, erosion with water runoff and uh, more water is going to infiltrate the ground. Aggregate stability is just a measure of of how well the soil particles hold together in, into an aggregate instead of just uh, compacting together and getting real tight where water can't infiltrate. And so um, the aggregate stability is, and bulk density is both affected by tillage and uh, crop residue on the soil surface and, and living roots in the soil. And so when we when we implement no-till and cover crops, that really benefits those two measurements greatly. And so I'd like to go over and demonstrate um, how we do infiltration rates. So I, I mentioned aggregate stability and bulk density influence water infiltration. And this is more of a direct measure of water infiltration. This is called a Saturo unit. It's automated. Um, so we set it up and we don't have to stand around and take measurements over time <clears throat> that, that this is sitting out in the field. And uh, for these, they typically run through their cycle in about an hour and a half to three hours. So we can set them up in the field, they run their cycle, we can take other soil samples, and when we're done there we can come back and pick these out of the field. And so we've got this computer head and pump right here. Uh, we've got a ring in the ground that I hammered in the ground earlier, and a water source. And so this is the, the head that goes on top of the ring. And so what we set that on there, clamp it down, and then we start the unit. And so it pumps water in. Um, into this head to a given, a given level and it creates pressure in here. And as that pressure, as the water soaks in the ground, uh, the pressure in that head decreases and the computer knows to pump more water back into the head. And then it takes the measurements and it gives us a readout at the end of, of the, the run that it, that it does. And so this is a really good way to measure water infiltration in our soils and uh, hopefully capture some of the benefits that cover crops and no-till 
uh, is, is some of the benefits that's uh, given to our farmers by implementing these practices. So what we just watched in the field are, are just, uh, just examples and, and demonstration of tools that we use to take these samples. There's some more nuanced details on how we take these samples. So if you got any more questions, just submit those in the Q&A box. And these demonstrations are, are pretty vast and uh, comprehensive and there's a lot of players involved. Um, Dave Freeze, uh, county agent in Greene County goes out and scouts weekly and you'll hear from him in a little bit. And then we're also doing some moisture sensor work and uh, Katie Womack uh, is, is our lead on that and she goes out weekly and, and checks those uh, moisture readings. And so we're gonna let her take over and she's gonna talk to you about what she's seeing out in the field with these uh, moisture sensors and, and how they how they relate to a cover crop and, and in our cropping system. So Katie. Thanks, Matt. Um, today, I have a PowerPoint for um, the Henson demo. Um, this demo is gonna be our second year that we have done it. Um, we have done soybean rotation on both years. Um, and so on the left side of the screen, that actually is the cover crop um, before they killed it. And then on the, the right side is gonna be our rain gauge. Um, we check that every week because this field is a um, non-irrigated. So we're pretty much just going on rainfall, um, which has been very interesting. Last year it was really wet. This year we've had some you know, dry spells. So we're really gonna see um, the difference in what the cover crop and the non-cover crop side is going to do. I mean, then that right hand side, there's going to be the picture of um, the Hensons actually planting. So on this screen, we have, you can just see the residue that's left over from the cover crop side. Um, it's just a really big difference in the no cover and the cover crop side. And this is right when they planted into it. And you can just see that, you know, there's more opportunity on that no cover crop side for weeds, um, for sunlight to get in for the weeds. Um, so that is just a really good reference to look at. Next, you can see um, just the difference in where, you know, the stand um, is just really bare in the no cover crop side. It's got a lot of residue in the cover crop side. So there's no opportunity really for weeds to come up in that cover crop side. Next, um, on the Henson demo, we have four sensors on um, each side. So we're um, reading those every Monday on the non-cover side and the cover side. And there is a six inch, a 12 inch, an 18 inch, and a 30 inch depth. Um, place and it is very interesting what we have seen so far um, the difference you know you can see this is what when we read these we can get these graphs out of it and we're manually reading them so these graphs just you can just see the big difference in you know what the cover crop you know what's hold, what there's moisture more moisture in the cover crop um, side than there may be in the non-cover crop side. So um, this year I think that we're going to have even more really good data to look at because we've had the dry spells um, where we didn't have that in 2019. So I'm really excited to see even what we have for this year for um, the Henson demo since we're just going off of the rainfall. And next we have um, the Smith demo. On that right side, PMP Consulting took a drone footage of um, actually where you can see the cover crop side on the left and the non-cover crop side on the right. And you can, it's just a really good picture to just be able to see the difference of the cover. And now we're going to look at actually doing a pipe planter design. So I'm gonna show you from the beginning, you can just see, actually this is Clay's um, Pipe Planner account and you can see they have their whole farm on there. And we have spent a lot of time on this and once it's done, you're, you're, you can go back and look at it every year. So I'm just gonna add a new farm. So we do Smith Demo.
and then it's going to take us into the screen and we're going to be able to find it. So we're going to go down and it is right here. And we're going to add our water source and it's going to be in this corner right here and we're going to name it. Their common name is Lindy South Forty, and we flow them so their gallons per minute, which is very important to know for a pipe planter design. Um, and the conservation district, we can flow the wells for you. So we go there and now we have the well or the riser. So now we just draw the field. And this is a really simple design, just a square field. And I always name the field the same as the, the well or the riser so um, that there's no confusion. You can just match it up later on in the design. This screen really doesn't mean anything right now. Um, maybe later on um, as pipe planter advances that there will be, you know, the, the crop type, field type, and planting date will come in play. So we're going to, they're on 38 inch beds. We're going to mark Our first and then we're going to mark our last and then we're going to mark our furrow direction and you want those to be straight the green and the red dot pretty much is just showing where the water starts where the water is going to end and then we're going to pick our design or our pick our water source and they're going to do every furrow because this is row rice and then because it says 40 hours. We really don't want to be watering for 40 hours. So, and we have a cover side and a non-cover crop side. So we want to water them separately because one may not be, need to be watered one side. So we're going to update that and split it into two sections. And so now we have two sides and we've got a 20 hour run and a 21 hour run. And so that's much better. Next, we're going to draw our pot and we just start at the green. And we end here and we are going to do an open end and then we're going to go ahead and draw our second and then open set summary so there's no elevation in where their pipe is laid which is very important and we can get the elevation here if you contact your conservation district we can help you with putting that in um, they're going to do 15 inch pipe um, and you obviously can change that. You can change it to 10, 12, 18, whatever you need. And, and technically, Pipe Planner is going to tell you 15 inch pipe is going to be the best with the 1100 gallons per minute. If it was under 1000 gallons, it probably would bump it down to 12 inch pipe. So we're going to view design. And here's where it shows your um, hole size. So your uniformity, that's an awesome number. We like for it to be above 90% and because we all want it to water out at the same time. So above 90% and then our minimum head pressure, we want water coming out. So we want it to be above 0.5. And then our maximum head pressure, we want it to be below 2.5. At 3.0, you will be busting pop. Um, and that's what we do not want. We want to prevent that because, you know, you've got lots of money. Um, involved into that. Next, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and I'm going to show you actually that left hand picture. You just see exactly where that, how you, the pipe is laid. Most people's done it. If you've been on a farm, walk behind that tractor, throw some dirt on it so it don't blow away. Then on that middle picture, so it's very important to leave an open end because you want to allow the burps throughout the year to come out so you don't blow pipe. Um, and so right here this farmer actually went by the design and you can see on your design, on your pipe planter design, there's a build up number in the right hand corner and it will show um, that your build up needs to be a foot and a half or two foot for water to not come out at the end of the pipe. And so they just got crafty and do a barrel and a pallet and there should be no water that comes out of that. Um, but the reason we do this is to prevent that the last picture there on the right is 
we nobody wants to deal with blown pipe. So lastly on Smith, we have installed sensors just like we did on Henson and we have uh, four sensors installed on non-side and four sensors installed on the hover side. And this is actually uh, Matt and I installed these. He's using his spot hammer there in that picture. And we go down to 6, 12, and 18 inch depth and place a sensor. And then there the, in that middle picture, there's a little box and it shows that's actually what the modern watermark box looks like. And you can plug in your manual reader and you can read that. That's what we get our data off of. And then on that right hand side, the John Deere actually we installed on the same row as John Deere did. So we can kind of compare what their sensors look like, what watermark sensors are looking like. And just it's a good to look at each data. And then again, my name is Katie Womack and I'm the irrigation specialist here in Craighead, Poinsett and Green. There's my number and my email. And um, if you need anything, just holler. We really appreciate your, your effort and work on this. Um, you've been really invaluable. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you going out weekly and checking those sensors. And it really helps us get good data collection. And uh, we're really grateful for you. So next up, uh, we're gonna have uh, Dave Freeze talk. Uh, he scouts for us weekly. Again, he's another invaluable piece to the puzzle. Um, he's gonna talk about uh, just pest pressures and uh, inputs uh, in, in these different demonstrations. And so Dave, we'll leave it, leave it up to you. Take it away. Thank you, man. Well, what a great day to have a virtual field tour. And I'd like to start out by, if you see the virtual background behind me, this is actually a picture that was taken at our Henson Randleman site uh, project field in 2019. So on our title slide here uh, is a picture at the top upper left again is a picture of the Henson Randleman site. And then uh, this year we began the row rise for project field with Smith Farms. So I do want to start out by saying it has been a great experience working with a, a good team of a lot of different folks with different specialties and and different things to bring to the table. Uh, what I've been asked to do as far as working with the team is to, to focus in the area of crop management and IPM or integrated pest management. So uh, if you look at the picture on the left, this is actually the cover crop the first year on the Henson Randleman site. Uh, Katie Womack and I were able to go out there and, and take some stand counts and evaluate our cover crop stand. Uh, the picture on the right, this is uh, what we've been doing with uh, looking at our cover crop and our cash crop in both operations to evaluate pest pressures that may come up and really, you know, focus on integrated pest management. And then finally, that last bullet there in this slide, it's all about making money for the farmer. So at the end of the day, we're going to look and see if we can incorporate cover crops for soil health and still be able to, the farmer, be able to make as much money or hopefully more. And we work closely with our entomologist, our economist, excuse me, to, uh, to assess this, this part of the piece of the pie. Um, this is a picture uh, in the upper right hand corner uh, of uh, the team we're planning back the fall of 2018. And there in the center in the red shirt is Adam Eads, he'll, he'll visit later. And he's our, 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 our team leader up here on the right, on the, in the red cap next to him is Corey Randleman, one of the farmers in this operation. Then on the other side of Adam in the blue shirt is Dustin Henson. He's the other farmer in the Henselman Randleman operation. I also want to point out next to him holding a piece of paper is Brandon Davis. He's a farmer and a crop consultant. Also, he's been looking at cover crops for four or five years now in his operation and does sell seed up this way. So he's been a great asset. And then there's the rest of the NRSC team helping out that day. So if we move to the lower right hand, uh, left hand picture, this shows our cover crop mix that was planted there a little bit closer up. And Katie, I think we were out there trying to figure out what was black oats and, and cereal rye. And we decided most of the time, if it's got that purple stem, it's a cereal rye. And we had about an even amount of each of those uh, that first year on the Henson Randleman site. We also had crimson clover was in that mix. Uh, the cover crop was planted at this site. 
I think around October 20th after soybean harvest that fall of 18. And then we had a really wet spring in 19. And so this pushed it pretty late on terminating the cover crop up until late May. And we did have a little bit of concern about what they call the green bridge, but it really, we didn't have any issues with it. We'll talk a little more about later. And so on the picture in the lower right, you can see the cover crop residue. You can see the Liberty Link soybeans that are emerging. They were planted on June 3rd and came up to a good stand. I think we ended up with 100,000 plants per acre in the cover field. And then in our no cover field, we ended up with 150,000 plants. Make a point here about our no cover field. Um, first of all, the way this, this location set up, there's a little creek or ditch between two small fields. The northern field is planted to cover crop. The southern field was no cover. And the farmer over the last few years has managed both of these fields pretty much the same, uh, continuous soybeans, a lot of times trying to plant no-till. Well, the first year we had the project going there in 2019, so much rain in the spring, the farmer had a big flush of pig weeds and uh, that came up and we had to, uh, to eliminate the weeds before planting. And so he came in with tillage and, and again, we uh, planted the same day then on the cover in the no cover field. So this picture, this slide here, if you look in the upper right hand uh, uh, picture, I do wanna point out again, our team leader, uh, he'll talk a little bit later. Then Katie is doing a great job on irrigation work up in this area. And then Matt Fryer has just been so, so good to work with and he's, all over the state working in several counties in the project. And I do want to mention his, one of the, our specialists, Mike Daniels, Dr. Mike Daniels in Little Rock. He worked closely with NRCS to, to assure that funding was available to evaluate cover crops and plant health. Plant health. So uh, thank you, Mike. Um, if you look at the picture in the lower left, again, this shows our, the first year on the Henson Randleman site where the, our pig wheat, our soybeans coming up. And boundary was used pre and after it broke, we had pigweed, little pigweeds that came up. The other weed was Texas Panicum. And uh, with a Liberty system, we were able to make one Liberty application on the cover field. And then we got the canopy closure and really worked good. And we feel like we didn't have as many pigweeds come up like Katie said, uh, it just that shading helped us out there. Now on the no cover field, we had to make two Liberty applications to achieve good weed control. The picture in the right hand side, uh, both fields had to be sprayed for earworms in early August and Besiege did a good job on them. We didn't have disease problems in either field. And here we are in year two and Katie, it's kind of a repeat in the spring. It was wet, wet, wet. So we got planted in early June, it has been drier, but then we had to spray for uh, earworms again here about a week ago. So again, it, we're gonna look at the economics. And so at the end of the first year, we looked at all the inputs, all the expenses, working with our U of A economist, Brianna Watkins is the lead there. And uh, the yields were pretty comparable, 50 bushels on the cover field, 49 where we didn't have cover. Uh, expenses, we had $20, I think, in our cover crop mix on the seed. The no cover field, we had additional tillage expenses to clean up at planting. And then we had the extra Liberty application. When you pencil that all out, we ended up with a net of $25 more per acre on the cover crop. So we were happy, happy to see in year one, you can incorporate cover crops and work toward soil health. And maybe two or three years down the, uh, the two or three years down the road, you're gonna see even a better response, especially in a dry land situation like this. Our second side again, up in the upper right hand corner is Clay Smith. You'll hear from him a little bit later. Just so great to work with. Um, he's the son in that operation. And uh, do you want to point out the picture in the lower right? Pitch, uh, Katie showed a drone picture earlier. This is a little bit closer up showing the cover crop on the left or the west part of the field. And then on the right is the no cover part of the field. Well, notice how the beds have not got knocked down this spring. We had a lot of rain this winter and that really uh, made that where we need to come in and do some tillage to reform the beds to get ensure good furrow irrigation. The center picture there, uh, the, this cover crop was planted the fall of 2019 uh, following soybean harvest. It was a mix of cereal grains, clover, and turnips. 
and ended up with a really, really good stand. Um, this did get terminated, uh, I think March the 10th or so, so that we could uh, be able to eliminate the green bridge, if you will, and get, get uh, rice planted. If you look at the right picture there, lower right, on April 20th came in and planted full page, 7521 rice, and uh, it ended up with a good stand in both the cover and no cover fields. If you look at the picture in the lower left here, this does show again the dividing line there at the Smith site. And you can see the cover side, the residue after the PowerMax application went out there in mid-March. And then on the, the right-hand side of that picture, you can see where the beds were reformed. Um, the center picture, uh, oh, let me point out Terry Smith. He's a father in this operation. Again, the Smiths are all just, they're good folks. It's so great to be able to get out and, and work with farmers like this who are forward thinking and, and don't mind to give up their time for the, for the good of, of everyone. And so there in the center again, uh, this is a picture of the seedling rice coming up and we used a command plus sharpen at planting time, command for grass and the sharpen, because in row rice, we wanna make sure to focus on keeping pigweed at bay overlapping residual program worked pretty good uh, good here and uh, of course we come in with preface uh, later and I do want to point out the crop consultant at this location is Austin Miller and he's doing a great job contributing as well. Picture in the lower right is a, fall, uh, a true army worm that came in shortly after the rice came up and did some feeding but the insecticide seed treatments did a good job of taking those out and uh, using a, a diamide and a neil nick to help extend hopefully some protection there and, and help with possibly the bill bug which our, our, our entomologists are trying to evaluate how to manage in row rice systems. So finally we'll work again with the Smiths to look at all their inputs, see what kind of yields they have on each side of the field cover versus no cover, pencil it all out and, and see see what the net returns are there. So. Again, great working at both these sites and working with this team. And at the end of the session today, we'll hope to answer any questions you may have. Back to you, Matt. Thanks, Dave. We greatly appreciate your hard work uh, on these demos. And I would say that the work you do and the information you collect is uh, more important than the, the samples I take in the field. It's definitely more applicable for sure, especially for our farmers. So next up, we're gonna have Adam Eads talk. He's a district conservationist there in Greene County, and he's going to talk a little bit about what NRCS has to offer our, our farmers as far as funding and, and, and kind of the role that they play uh, in, in this whole puzzle. So Adam, take it away. Thank you, Matt. It is, it is good to be a part of such a great partnership. And my goal today is to talk about the benefits of the partnership, and maybe we can encourage more participation in other places uh, with uh, with some of these demonstrations. So jumping right in, I want to uh, share three slides and uh, three points. The, uh, the three points I'd like to share from an NRCS perspective. First of all, agriculture and natural resource disciplines are just too broad to not be working in a cooperative fashion. Secondly, financial assistance agreements alone won't affect change at the rate that's needed with current trends in groundwater and other areas of concern. And then thirdly, NRCS and other agencies, we have to be known for sound technical advice. There's just no replacement for working in the field with farmers and partners. So that first point, as I elaborate on it, you know, agriculture and natural resource, resource disciplines are just too broad anymore to not be working in a cooperative fashion. We, um, the, the roads of conservation and production have never been more parallel than they are today. And so as we can leverage resources and work with Extension, ASU, the farmers in the field, we're um, compounding those, those benefits as we work through that. So I've got a few examples I'd like to share. The pictures that I have uh, in, in the bottom left, that was this summer we were able to be with social distancing and masks in place. You can see everybody's scattered out there. We were able to go to the field and participate with the uh, Kerrigal Leadership class. This has been going on a while and Extension has allowed us to be a part of this. But this is the first summer that we were able to, to go to the field and talk about one of our demonstrations. So that's at the Smith Row Rice demo. 
And these are emerging community leaders that, that are, are shown there that are going through this leadership class. So we were able to educate on things such as, you know, the equipment that, that we're using, uh, how much water it takes to grow a crop of, crop of rice, which can, uh, when, when you talk about that, can, um, can be surprising to some people. And with Western Green County, the critical groundwater area and other hot spots um, showing in Green County and within the Delta, um, that's, that's good to know as these local people are, are making policy and just becoming educated on what agri agriculture means to the community. So that was a, a very um, good thing to be a part of. In the bottom right is a picture showing one of my favorite field days that I've ever been a part of. Back in April of 2019, we were able to catch a rain. You know, that's that's a time that's hard to get farmers uh, to, to do anything because they're planting, they're just busy. But you can see we had a good group there uh, that represented extension specialists. We had uh, the county judge there. We had farmers, consultants, uh, NRCS staff, and had a great discussion in the field to talk about, uh, as you can see, the cover crop. Um, Dave mentioned that the first year of the Henson Randleman the cover crop went, uh, you know, pretty far in maturity because it was wet. So we were able to talk about that and talk about this new production system and, and equipment, um, things that would be needed there to make that shift to this new production system. So it was a great opportunity to get everyone together. There was there was groups forming, uh, you know, and and no one left right after we were done because they were all talking and eager to learn. So. Just this collaboration is so important because, um, you know, in RCS, we cover everything from uh, forest land to cropland, pasture land to energy conservation, uh, confined animal in places, and it can be very broad. So it's been a great benefit for us to be able to have training opportunities and, and to reach a broader audience. My second point. Uh, financial assistance agreements just aren't keeping pace with the rate that we need to affect change if we're going to, to reverse some of these trends we're seeing. Um, we're, we're about 20% sustainable in our groundwater use, and uh, we have many other areas of concern that are, that are growing. So uh, just to, to hit on um, Green County and a couple of our main working lands programs uh, and to show the competitiveness in them, and to give you some ideas of, of how important it is to have other avenues. The EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentives Program in Greene County, we had 197 applications for 2020. We're on track to fund about 15 of those. So 10 or more of those are going to be from a special watershed initiative because of Cash River and the impaired segments that, that we have. So a special project there that even brings in more funding to Greene County and we've been lucky to, to have that extra funding, but some may, some offices may only fund one application. So if, if you're looking at funding less than 10% of the people that are trying to get into the program, uh, you've got to find other ways. And uh, similarly with the conservation stewardship program, we had 38 applications for 2020, and it's looking like we're going to be able to fund far less than 10% as, as that's ongoing. And a couple of reasons uh, that we're seeing with the CSP program, money seems to be trending downward in CSP as the Farm Bill seeks to streamline EQIP and CSP. And then also a, a new a change with the new Farm Bill is we're funding all five years of the CSP program uh, at, at obligation in that first year, whereas in older Farm Bills, we would fund one year at a time, which would lead to more contracts going in each year. But it's good for the farmer that knows I'm getting the full five years and not um, future years would be subject to availability of funding. And to wrap that slide up, um, since 2013, because of this partnership, uh, we've had 27 outreach events in cooperation with Extension, representing contacts with about 1,175 people. So it's been very beneficial for us to partner with these agencies and reach a broader audience. And my last point is NRCS and other agencies have to be known for sound technical advice. There's just no replacement for working in the field with farmers and partners. Um, as our country becomes further removed from agriculture, our workforce does as well. 
I grew up on a rice and soybean farm and wouldn't trade that experience for anything. It helps me daily in my job, especially here in the Delta. Uh, however, there are many new employees coming to us that don't have that experience. Uh, and you can't learn everything from a book or from school. So working hand in hand with farmers in the field, there is no replacement. A couple of things I'd like to point out there is we have interns uh, every summer. And in the bottom left picture, you can see that's Ricky Gilbert. She just finished her second uh, summer with NRCS as an intern. She actually came to us with some experience because of extension. She had worked with Dr. Bill Robertson the summer before. So she was familiar with soil health demonstrations. And you could see she's in the field uh, for the first year of the Henson Randleman cover crop demo to install soil moisture sensors with Matt and Katie. And then in the bottom right picture, that's Haley Dobbs. She is converted to the soil conservationist now. And I think recently went to, to Oklahoma. So we, we lost her, but she was able her summer here to be uh, working on Terry Smith's farm and Clay's farm to, uh, to cut trays for a rainfall simulator. Uh, that's Dr. Green and Keith Scoggins. So ASU and RCS working together to train a, what was an intern at the time. And she's, she's doing very well for the agency now. And the picture, even though it's unrelated to my caption there, the chief of NRCS has saw the need to create what we call the CAMP program, which is the Conservation Agricultural Mentoring Program. And that's based off seeing the need for creating a, a diverse background within um, the employees that we're getting. So that program, new for 2020, is going to offer some of the same uh, pattern that, that we've had in place in Greene County and been utilizing for a few years now. And uh, that's one-on-one -on -one contact with a farmer through a mentoring program. And we've, we've had a lot of that in place here in Green County. So I'm thankful for farmers like uh, Dustin and Corey and Terry and Clay and, and many others for the relationship we have there. Just like to end uh, with my contact information, if I can be of any help, I know we're gonna have a question and answer session, look forward to, and with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Matt. Thanks, Adam. Uh, man, I really appreciate you. Appreciate your collaboration, uh, your friendship in this project, and uh, you've been invaluable. So thanks a bunch for the effort. Um, next up, we're going to go to Clay Smith in the field. He's going to talk to us about surge valves and, and how that helps them on their farm conserve water and, and when they're irrigating their crop and a little bit about how Natural Resource Conservation Services helps them uh, on their farm. So Clay. Hey, today we are gonna look at a uh, surge valve systems. Um, and here we have a pump that is running a well. And actually in this field, there's two wells running. You have underground pipe uh, to your outlet. And this is your bonnet on top of a riser that gets your water flow to come out of the ground. This is groundwater we're pumping. We have a Z pipe that goes to our surge valve. And that's what I'm going to be talking to them today about is a PNR surge valve. What a surge valve does is basically switches the water back and forth so you don't have to do it. It saves time, it saves money, and it's a lot more efficient for the farmer that has thousands of acres to cover. Um, on usual irrigation where we would just have a switching manual T here where you have to do it manually, we might let this water setting run for 12 hours or 24 hours. If we set it at 8 a.m., we start it, we come back the next morning and we, we switch it. Um, with that, you have a lot of tail water that runs into the ditch that you're not getting to utilize. Here, we're setting up the surge valve to let it water back and forth, back and forth on however long you set, set it to run. So a range from 12 hours to 24 hours, depending on your soil type and your acres and your how long your rows are. Here we would set it up on an 18 or a 24 hour run. And there's two different types of uh, P and R heads, a junior and a pro, one's digital and one's manual. Um, and it'll switch back and forth 
on the principle that it goes down there so far in the field, maybe say in this 70 acre field, a quarter of the way uh, in the first hour, and then it switches to the next side. It goes a quarter of the way. It switches back and forth for 24 hours until it gets to the soaking period, which means after the 24 hour period, it'll go to one side and stay for however long you set it, say an hour and a half, and then it'll switch back. So we're running water through the field, getting it infiltrated without running water through the tail ditch. There's different uh, soil types that goes into effect that you have to uh, take into account. So sandy, silt, and clay soils. On sandier soils, um, the challenge with coarse soil is minimizing deep percolation. So on a sandy field, um, you may run the water setting on 12 hours on one side and all your water is going in in the first half of the field and it's not running out. So when you switch it back and forth on a sandy, on a sandy field, uh, it's getting down there, it's switching. That side is gonna dry up a little bit. It's gonna switch back, it's gonna go a little bit further. So you're trying to push the water to the end without running the water out of the field. Uh, on clay soils, they'll tend to crack and they want to run a little bit longer, uh, say three or four cycles instead of maybe 10 cycles. So you're trying to run the water as far as you can in the field and then switch it because it seem, seems to soak up faster. On silty ground like this, this field is, um, it's very useful because it'll, it'll go as far as it can and soak up and then switch. There's many different types of variations you can do uh, with a surge valve and they, they really help us on our farm. We have probably uh, eight to 10 surge valves. It makes it where we can, we don't have to come check the field as often and make sure it's watering out. We can set it and we can leave it for 24 hours and then shut the pump off. Our local NRCS in Greene County, uh, they have a program where you can rent them and I was able to rent some a few years ago and that's how I became um, familiar with the surge valve. Katie Womack at NRCS, she helped us out getting it set up, uh, how to switch it back and forth, how to set it up. Um, and also Dave Freeze at Extension, Green County Extension. He helps us with uh, irrigation timing. So he helps us get it set up and how we need to run it. In summary, surge irrigation is the intermittent application of water down the furrow. The use of program automated valve is used with flat polypipe with a set size. Surge irrigation must be adapted and adjusted to field and soil type conditions. Plain surge irrigation sets for a total irrigation time of 24 hours and uses computerized hole selection to determine flat uh, polypipe plan. Um, also, you can have it not just in the middle of the field, it depends on when you're, where your outlet is. If it's on the edge of the field, you may run a half a roll of polypipe and another full roll of polypipe to water half and half. Um, it's really helping us and I think it'll help you guys uh, too. Thanks so much, Clay. We, we appreciate your time and these demonstrations and your willingness to, to join us for these broadcasts and uh, making, the, making these uh, videos for us to learn learn about your operation. Uh, again, we just thank so much. So again, uh, we're almost uh, to the point for our live Q&A session, but first I'd like to thank uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service for funding this broadcast, these virtual field trip series hosted by University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. And so we hope you've, you've enjoyed uh, learning a little bit about these demonstrations. And so if you'd like to learn more about the Soil and Water Conservation uh, virtual field trip series, just visit uaex.edu. And so I'd also like to point out that we're gonna have a, a few quick poll questions for you to answer. And so those will pop up on your screen. So if you take a minute and answer those, uh, we'd appreciate it. And so now uh, let's move on into our, uh, to our live Q and A. Um, we've got a few questions here. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll go to Katie first on this one. Um, could you just explain a little bit more about uh, what pipe planter is uh, and the goal of it. Um, just why do we use pipe planter uh, and, uh, and a little bit about what polypipe is. Yeah, Matt. Um, so on pipe planter, um, lots of farmers, uh, they just get in the routine of just 
poking a hole and it's probably not very efficient. And so the most important thing to do is um, to um, flow that well so we know what gallons per minute we're getting. And then um, after that, uh, we that gives us the hole sizes. And it's just a big calculation. Pipe planner is just a big number system software pretty much. Um, and it puts into play their roll size. It puts in play what um, their gallons per minute is. And then the amount of feet that you've got of pipe. And it gives you the right hole size so it's very uniform and you're not blowing pipe. Um, and they're saving money in the end because um, it's uniform. Thanks, Katie. Uh, that really clears things up a bit. Um, our next question, um, I think I'll answer this one. Uh, the question is, could you explain why you go to different depths with the soil moisture sensors? And so for those uh, sensors, uh, we have different depths uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, crop roots are gonna go down deeper uh, depending on soil structure, soil health, um, and they're gonna use water at different depths depending on, on, on how far the roots go down. And so when we have moisture sensors at different depths, we can capture uh, how deep those roots are going down and using moisture. Another thing is that if, if our soil health or soil physical properties that aggregate stability I talked about earlier, if, that's, if those uh, values and properties are, are good, um, that water will infiltrate deeper down in the profile and we can utilize more rainfall instead of it running off the surface of the field um, and, and off the field and, and not utilized by our crop. And so that really helps us to really gauge uh, if, if we're utilizing rainfall or not compared to if we just had a, a single sensor in the ground at six inches. So our next question is, um, are local soil and water conservation districts part of this effort? So uh, Adam, would you mind answering that one? Uh, are, are local soil and water conservation districts part of these demonstrations? Yes, sir, they sure are. In fact, um, for multiple ways, you know, through agreements, the Greene County Conservation District is helping us with staffing. Um, Katie, which was the irrigation specialist for uh, a, over a year, She's converted to a soil conservationist now, but Tyler Renshaw, our new irrigation specialist, is, is gathering those readings now. Um, they do uh, rent the surge valves. They, uh, they're streaming live on Facebook today. So the Greene County Conservation District and their support is very much a, a big part of the partnership. Thanks, Adam. Uh, before we go to the next question, um, I'd like to let everybody know that uh, today's virtual field trip has been approved for professional development credit if you're with the Arkansas Department of Education uh, for teachers. And also if you're a certified crop advisor, uh, this virtual field trip has been approved for continuing education units. So if you'd like access to those, just email uh, jrobinson at uaex.edu uh, and she'll get you connected with uh, the information that you need. So the next question is, um, do you think that these participating farmers that are participating in these demos uh, will continue with cover crops after the demonstrations are over? And have they planted cover crops on other fields as a result of these demonstrations? And so uh, Dave, uh, I'll let you and, and Adam maybe answer those. Um, Dave, if you'll go first. Um, so again, just to repeat the question, are, are the participating farmers, will they continue to use cover crops uh, after the demonstrations are over? And have they planted more cover crop fields because of these demonstrations? I believe they will. Uh, I know on the Henson Randleman operation, they uh, had already seen an, another neighbor and how successful it was there. And so they discontinued and they've had, I think a good experience this, this, this first two years working with them. So. I see them expanding acreage where they can. Uh, the Smith operation, of course, Clay's with us today, but there are, they're giving it a big look too, and, and their neighbors are always watching them, and you see a lot of their neighbors trying it as well. So with that, I guess I'll pass it over to Adam. Well, and 
you know, Clay may be able to speak as well to this. They have a very neat story, and I think he would say the same. Uh, they started with just a few acres as they started with ASU, and now they're across their whole operation because of what they're seeing with, with water savings in, in their corn production and other things. So, yes, I think um, these guys came to us with a vested interest to learn more, and they will continue and have been a huge part in educating other farmers. We've uh, seen a lot of that. Clay, we'll let you go ahead and give input on that. What's your thoughts on, on uh, cover crop use, soil health, and will you continue to do this after the demonstration's over? Yeah, we uh, started with just uh, a few, you know, 40 acres. We tried it on and we really liked it. That's been three or four years ago. And uh, now we're up to, you know, 1,500, 2,000 acres that it's helping us that much. Uh, it helps us in our corn acres where we grow corn behind corn. Uh, it gives us just the few extra days we need so the crop don't burn up. Uh, if it don't get irrigated in them a couple of days, then it still holds on for us to get it irrigated. That's the main benefits we're, we're seeing. Thanks, Clay. We appreciate you being on here and uh, giving your input. Um, let's move on to the next question. Um, I guess we'll go to, uh, I guess we'll go back to Katie on this. Uh, do you see the adoption of soil moisture sensors increasing? Yes, I do. Uh, I see it very common already that people are getting one to try and um, then they really like it and the next year they add a few more to their operation. Um, and there's so many different options with soil moisture sensors. You know, there's um, ones that you can do manually. You can, you know, you only have to have three depths. You can do four depths. You know, there's ones that just have one probe and then the telemetry that you add to it. Um, farmers are really starting to really like to be able to see what's going on down where they can't see what's going on um, and what the plants are doing, what they're taking up and at what level they're taking up um, moisture. So I really do think that this is gonna become more common. Hey, what about you on your farm? I know we're using them on the demonstration sites. Uh, do you have them on a lot of acres that y'all are utilizing these sensors on or, or not? Yeah, we use uh, soil moisture sensors on a couple fields. Um, you can tell the difference between a, like last year we had it on a non-cover cornfield versus a cover crop cornfield. And the cover crop cornfield got watered about half as much. We kept saying, man, we need to water it, we need to water it, but based on the sensor, uh, it was telling us not to. And uh, yeah, so you can see the difference between those two. So it's really helping us. Okay, Clay, we appreciate it. We're about out of time. Uh, so we just wanna thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you've learned a little bit about the collaborative efforts that, that's going on across the Delta uh, and especially in Greene County. They've been a great uh, example of, of what these demonstrations are meant to do is, is to, to, cl to facilitate collaboration between all these state and federal organizations to benefit our farmers uh, to improve profitability in our soils. And so again, we just, we thank you. If you'd like to see more um, with the virtual field trip, again, just visit uaex.edu. We hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining us for the Soil and Water Conservation Virtual Field Trip. This broadcast is funded by NRCS and produced by the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. To find out more about soil and water conservation, visit uaex.edu.